السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جمعة مباركة I'm going to recite from سورة الفاطر chapter 35 and the verse number is 27 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر أن الله أنزل من السماء ماء فأخرجنا فأخرجنا بثمرات مختلفا ألوانها ومن الجبال بدد بيض وحمر مختلف ألوانها وحمر مختلف ألوانها وغرابي بسود ومن الناس والدواب والأنعام مختلف ألوان كذلك إنما يخشى الله من عبادي الذين يتلون كتاب الله وأقاموا الصلاة وأنفقوا وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا يرجون تجارة لن تبور ليوفيهم أجورهم ويزيدهم من فضله إنه غفور شكور والذي أوحينا إليك من الكتاب هو الحق مصد هو الحق مصدقا لما بين يديه إن الله بعباده لخبير بصير ثم 
على الصلاة حي على الصلاة إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في سبيل الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين وأصلي وأسلم عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى تابعهم ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله العظيم وطاعته وأحذركم من معصيته ومخالفة أمره ونهيه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لقد وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Praise be to Allah, we praise Him, we seek His guidance and forgiveness. Whomever Allah guides, none can misguide. And whomever is left without guidance, none can guide besides Allah. We bear witness that there is no one worth worshipping but Allah. And we bear witness that Muhammad is his last prophet and messenger. Prayers and peace of Allah be upon him, upon his companions, upon his followers and their followers till the day of judgment. Ameen. Servants of Allah have the taqwa of Allah. That is, have the balance between the love of Allah, the respect of Allah, and the fear of the punishment of the hereafter. Servants of Allah have the taqwa of Allah and do not die except on the state of Islam, the state of su submission to the will and the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amma ba'd. When we recite the Qur'an, we pass by stories. And the stories of the Qur'an make around one-third of the Qur'an. But one of the interesting things that we would notice when we recite the Qur'an, that there are some stories that are repeated more than once. Actually, some stories are repeated many times. Yet, there are stories that are mentioned only once. Have you ever asked yourself, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeat stories in the Qur'an? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeat certain stories and does not repeat others? Why there is a story that's mentioned only once, yet there are other stories that are mentioned tens of times? I asked myself this question and I always wondered what is the wisdom behind that? After years of dealing with people and interacting with my fellow members of my faith, I came to realize that the stories that are repeated quite often in the Qur'an or the stories that are recommended to be recited often, like Surah Al-Kahf is reminded, we are encouraged to recite Surah Al-Kahf every Friday and the stories of Surah Al-Kahf are recited quite often, while other stories in the Qur'an are mentioned many times. I came to conclude or I came to notice that these stories that are repeated many times in the Qur'an or that are recited quite oftenly, everyone knows them. Everyone knows the story of the children, uh, the, the youth of the Kahf, of the cave. Everyone knows the story of Prophet Musa a.s. Everyone knows the stories that are repeated quite often in the Qur'an. 
While the stories that are mentioned only once, and they're not recited quite often, I came to realize that only few people know them. Only few people who learn the Qur'an and recited it regularly and study it uh, officially. That brought to my attention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He repeats a certain story in the Qur'an quite often, He's telling us that this story is extremely important and He wants us all to know it. He wants us all to know the details of that story. He wants us all to know the lessons in that story. All of us know the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. We read it quite often through the Quran. That means all of us understand the lessons from that story. All of us learn certain things from that story. And that is one of the things that I personally found the reason to be for this repetition. One of the stories that's mentioned in the Quran quite often is the story that we recited earlier. The story of the creation of Prophet Adam alayhi salam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and he commanded the angels and Iblis to bow down, to prostrate to Adam, give him the allegiance that he is their leader, that everything in this world is going to be dedicated to serve this human being. Iblis rejected the order of Allah, refused to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he explained why did he refuse, why did he defy the commands from Allah, he said, I am better than him. Look at me. I'm created from fire, and this creature that you're asking me to bow to is created from mud. I am better than him because of the way I'm created, not because of his achievements, not because of the things that he's done, just simply because of his nature because of his color, because of his race. He rejected the divine command and act arrogantly because of his nature. He thought he is better. He had entitlement feeling that he is better than Adam simply because of his nature. Both the disobedience and the arrogance that Iblis committed were the first sins ever to be committed. And because of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expelled him out of his mercy. And he told him that you will be cursed until the day of judgment. This story is mentioned in the Quran seven times. Throughout the Quran, you'll see from Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-A'raf, Surah Al-Isra, Surah Al-Kahf, Surah Taha, Surah Sa'd that we recited earlier. All these surahs have a portion in it that talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angels and Iblis to bow to Adam. They all obeyed, but Iblis rejected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeated this story throughout the Quran to teach us many lessons. One of the very important lessons that we learn from this story, that we learn from these surahs, is the horrible nature of racism, prejudice, arrogance because of the nature of the person. This is sickness. This is a major sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Quran to teach us that arrogance to be conceded is rejected completely in Islam, especially if it's based on your nature based on your color, based on your race. That is one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ came to fight at the beginning of his message. The principle of equality, the Qur'an established it. Allah says in the Qur'an, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ O mankind, we have created you from one male and one female. All of you come from the same origin. And we made you into tribes and nation so you can interact with each other. Indeed, the best among you are the most righteous. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ we have honored the children of Adam. He did not say 
which children of Adam. He did not say that he honored a certain race or a certain color or a certain nationality. He said all the children of Adam, anyone who's considered a human being, Allah says, deserve to be honored. Allah says also, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ Among the signs of your Lord is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the difference in your colors and your languages. This is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something to celebrate, something to cherish as humans that we have different beautiful colors among us. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, humans are equal just like the, 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 the spikes of the comb. All of them on the same level in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said very clearly, لا فضل لعربي على أعجمي ولا أعجمي على عربي ولا أبيض على أسود ولا أسود على أبيض إلا بالتقوى. There is no favor. There is no superiority of any nationality over another nationality. There is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab or over a non or an, of a non-Arab over an Arab or of a colored or, or white over black or black over white except with righteousness. There is no superiority that could be given or entitled because of the color of our skin or the nationality or the race or the origins of our nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us through Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet Muhammad before he died, what did he say? Kullukum li Adama wa Adama min turab. All of you go back to Adam and Adam was created from dirt or mud. All of you, he did not say only those belong to Adam and those don't. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he's not one of us, those who call for racism and prejudice. He's not one of us who fight based on race or nationalities. He's not one of us who died because of the call for racism or prejudice. When the companions had a disagreement between them, they start calling on each other's heritage and, and nationalities and, and origins. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ada'wal Jahiliyati wa ana bayna dhahranikum. You're calling each other with the call of Jahiliyyah, the times of arrogance before Islam. And I'm still living with you, and I'm still amongst you. Da'uha fa innaha natina. Abandon these calls. They are rotten. Rotten, he says. Natina. Also, when Abu Dharr abused Bilal ibn Rabah and he called him with a very insulting word which equal to the n-word nowadays the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said fika you are a man of ignorance you still have remnants of the era before Islam in your heart Abu Dhar could not handle it and he went and apologized to Bilal the way Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam honored Bilal ibn Rabah, who was an African slave, and he asked him to make the adhan on top of the Kaaba, is a symbol of equality. Insha'Allah, next week, we'll dedicate the khutbah just to talk about Bilal ibn Rabah and how Islam honored him and honored everyone who was looked down at by the society at his time. When Islam came, came to reject racism and prejudice and slavery. Slavery was the epitome, was the best manifestation of, of, of racism and prejudice. And Islam gradually got rid of it. Gradually and little by little in a non-confrontational way until it was er eradicated. It's very interesting to know that in the 1700s or the 1800s, one of the Muslim kings in Africa sent a letter to the American leaders, telling them that slavery should be abolished and should be abandoned, and that should not be the way to establish a new nation. That is something that we should be all proud of. When Islam came, it made equality between Bilal and Rabi'ah, between Suhaib and Abu Jahl, between Salman and Abdullah ibn Ubay, 
these equalities, the people did not like it at that time. That was one of the reasons why they fought Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu That's one of the reasons they rejected Islam because the society was built on racism. The society was built on, on discrimination and prejudice. The elites are benefiting from this system. So when Prophet Muhammad is saying that they're equal with their slaves, that they're equal with people from different colors, they did not like it. And that's why they saw Islam as a threat to their structure and to their uh, environment. And that's why they fought it. But Islam prevailed. And the call for equality happened. And the abolishing of slavery succeeded. And alhamdulillah, the world start enjoying the taste of equality that the, until we arrived where we at nowadays a huge difference between what we're living in nowadays and how the world used to be a thousand years ago or even 500 years ago or even a hundred years ago less than a hundred years ago black kids in america and white kids could not drink from the same fountain that is something to keep in mind african-american community did not have the right to vote so what we're living in is a major advancement to what we had in the past. But are we there yet? Absolutely not. Are we at the perfect level yet? Absolutely not. We will strive until the day of judgment to achieve perfection when it comes to racism, when it comes to prejudice rejection. We will strive all our lives until we see 100% equality between everybody, regardless of their color, regardless of their faith. What we have seen in the past few days in Minnesota and the death of a man, George Floyd, in a brutal act is a sign that we're not there yet. What we've seen in the past in Ferguson and Georgia and even in LA with the death of Rodney King, these were signs and continuation of the slavery that America lived in many years ago. Look at the difference. When a young African-American girl is kidnapped, it doesn't make the news or the headlines as much when it's a white girl that's kidnapped. When a young black boy or man is killed, it doesn't make the news as much when it's a white young boy or man is killed. There was a social experiment that I saw on TV. They put a camera and they asked a young African-American man to go and try to open the car, and a locked car, with a, with, a, with a piece of metal. When people asked him, why are you doing this? He said, I forgot my keys inside the car. Guess what? Every single person called the police on him. After a short while, they did the same experiment with a young white man or boy doing exactly the same act and nobody called the police on him. They did the same, the same group did another experiment. They brought a young African-American boy and they asked him to cut the chains on a bike that was tied in a park. Everyone called the police on him. The same exact location and the same exact bike and the same exact act was taped and recorded with a Caucasian young man. No one called the police on him. So this stereotypical mentality, this racism that we have, still have in our nation, is painful. It's painful for the people who are losing loved ones simply because of the color of their skin. It's painful for us as humans to see it in front of our eyes, seeing that, that man losing his life, even if he did a mistake. But it's not deserving to be killed in such a brutal way, when he is bleeding and saying, I cannot breathe, I cannot breathe, please. And when he starts calling his mom at the end, Wallahi, it bleeds our hearts. It's painful for us as a nation. It harms us. It harms our moral values. It harms our reputation. It harms the, the, the law enforcement, the good law enforcement members who are against this kind of things. It harms us as a nation and as Muslims. We do have a duty when we see these things. Do not tell me it's not my business. Do not say it's not my responsibility. It is. How do I know that? Because your beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man ra'a minkum munkaran, Any of you, 
You see evil, change it. Act against it. Do something to stop it. If you cannot, say something against it. If you cannot, at least reject it with your heart. And this is the weakest form of faith. If you have not done any of these three things in the past few days, if you did not do anything or say something or at least felt bad for this man who was killed, then you are beyond the weakest form of faith. You are less than the weakest form of faith based on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So what do I do and how can I have a role in doing things? Insha'Allah, I'll give you a few advice and tips in the uh, second part of the khutbah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه فيا فوز المستغفرين استغفر الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين my dear respected brothers and sisters, we continue the discussion in today's talk about racism, prejudice, discrimination, something as Muslims we suffered from. Since 9-11, we as Muslims paid the price of these kinds of horrible and heinous actions. But what we went through as American Muslims is uncomparable to what's happening to our brothers and sisters in the African American community. And our Muslim brothers and sisters in the African American community are getting the double impact. They're getting, they're getting it from both, from being Muslims and from being African American. We talked about how Islam started this movement in rejecting all kind of racism and all kind of discrimination and, and prejudice and the story of Iblis how he rejected to bow to Adam السلام, simply because of his prejudice because of his racism because of his feel of superiority over Adam because of his nature because of the way he was created so the question is what do I do what do I do as an American Muslim living in the times of COVID what do I do the first thing you should all do, and we, including myself, is we need to educate ourselves about the struggle of the African-American community, starting from slavery time until nowadays. The fact that we had an African-American president several years ago does not mean that racism is over in America. That does not mean discrimination against African-American is over. Actually, it became much worse after the election of Obama. Because those who were shy or embarrassed from expressing their racism and prejudice, they felt redemption that, look, we have a president now, we're not a racist country anymore. On top of that, our current leadership and presidency is promoting all kind of hatred towards the others and the entitlement feeling to certain race over the other. So we need to educate ourselves. One of the biggest challenges we face, especially among the immigrant community, that they have no clue about the things that, are faced, that the African-American community is facing. So the first step, we need to learn and to teach ourselves about the struggle and the pains that our African-American brothers are going through. Number two, we should support in every way possible anyone who's fighting racism, prejudice, and discrimination in America, as long they do it with logical and rational methods, as long they're doing it with genuine and sincere desire to help the African-American community. Be careful that there are people who are complete opportunistics, that they're trying to take advantage of the moment and make themselves look as heroes, only for their political gains, only for their financial gain. So make sure that you're smart enough to discriminate or find out the difference, differentiate between those who are genuinely trying to promote the rights of the minorities and the African-American community and those who are doing it for their own interests and their own benefit. So that support verbally on social media, get into there once the shutdown is over and there is a rally, why not be part of it? 
and show with your Muslim identity that Islam supports the rights of people who are going under racist attacks, those who are facing discrimination. That is number two. Number three, do not think and belittle your efforts and say, I cannot change. Do not say, I, I'm not going to make a difference. One of the companions, his name is Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he was blind. And he went to the battle of Al-Qadisiyah with his brothers in, 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 in the times of Umar al-Khattab. When he decided to go out, they told him, why are you going? You're not going to be able to fight. You're blind and you're excused. He said his famous statement. He said, Let me increase the number of the Muslims. Let me increase the number of people who are calling for truth. When you are part of any movement that calling for goodness, do not underestimate the power of one. Do not underestimate that by you just simply being there, you'll increase the number of likes on Facebook. You'll increase the number of people's faces on the picture. You'll increase the number of people marching or walking towards into, into the rally. You'll increase the voices are calling for change and eradicating racism and discrimination in America. Do not underestimate your power. If everyone says, I'm not going to make a difference, then no one's going to go out. So make sure that you have your print somewhere in these times. Number five. If you see it in front of your, if you see acts of racism and discrimination in front of you, whether at work, whether in the bus, whether on the street, whether on TV, whether online, do not stay quiet. Do not allow it to happen in front of you. Do not be a mute devil. Do not be a person who sees evil and says nothing. Say something. Confront those racists. Take a picture or a video of them while they're committing the crime. This is one of the things that we as Muslims benefited. When our sisters wearing the hijab were attacked in the bus and the trains. And people recorded and said, do not do that. It benefited us. It showed the prejudice and the hatred that some people had towards us. So let us do the same. It will make a difference. If it happens at your workplace, do not say, I will lose my job. I don't want to say, no. That's the worst excuse you can say that I will lose my job. That's why I'm not going to say anything. Or I'll be in trouble with my superiors if I say something. No, that's the worst excuse you can say or, or take to do not to do anything. Do not be afraid. Say the truth. Didn't Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the best kind of jihad is to say the truth against injustice and against tyranny? Didn't Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teach us that? So what's the tyranny in your eyes? To lose your job? To be yelled at by a police officer? Say it. Say it out loud. And make sure that you understand that this, is, this will make a difference. Finally, clean your heart from any remnants of racism and discrimination. When a new Muslim comes to our masjid, does it make a difference? which race he belongs to in your heart? Does it make a difference what color his skin is? If it does, you need to work on that. That's a problem. Our celebration, our joy, our happiness, when someone says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, should be the same regardless of the color of their skin. Regardless of their race. If you feel different, then you need to work on that. Number two, someone moves to your neighborhood. Ask yourself, how do you feel based on your color, the color of their skin? If you have a different feeling towards different people, that's a problem. You need to work on that. When your son comes with a friend or your daughter comes with a friend to, school, to, to home, do you feel any difference based on their race, based on their nationality? Yes, you have the right to feel if it's a bad friend or a bad influence. But just simply because of their, the color of their skin or their race, that is something you need to fix. If someone comes and asks for your daughter's hand, a young Muslim who's compatible, who's respectful, who's educated, who's successful, and then you say, but the color of his skin, take that out of your mind. Don't, never allow this to be an excuse 
to reject someone to be part of your family. Whether if your son comes and says, I got engaged, I want to get engaged to this sis, sis girl, or your daughter comes and tells you, there's a man who comes and to, wants to get married to me. Never look at the color of the skin. Look at the other compatibilities. Look at the, 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 their personality. Look at their khuluq. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ If you receive a person who asks for your daughter's hand and he has good manners and he has good behaviors and he has good faith commitment, then you should accept him. وَإِلَّا تَفْعَلُوا تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ وَفَسَادٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ If you don't do that, fitna and corruption will spread on earth. So let us make sure that we take that out of your mind. Your friends or relatives who just migrated to America from another country, especially a Middle Eastern country, teach them that the tribal mentality that corrupted the minds of Muslims for the past hundred years and made them to be more racist and more prejudiced towards others has no room for it here. And they should get it out of their vocabulary. They should get it out of their minds. They should get it out of their mentality. That is what we need to teach our brothers and sisters who come to the community or migrate to the country. Keep that in mind. And remind yourself. Before you say a word, before you say a joke, is it racist? Is it disrespectful to a certain group of people? If it is, don't say it. Don't say it and don't go forward with it. And don't laugh about it and don't say, please forgive me for saying that. Take it out from your mind. Take it out from your vocabulary. A lot of people are criticizing imams and shiuch for not speaking out. Believe me, all the imams and all the shiuch are speaking out against racism. Some of them might not be able to eloquently express themselves or because they're not very well educated about this. But privately on, and, and publicly, everyone is condemning these kind of things. All the religious scholars, all the Islamic scholars are against this kind of racism. Never ever think that simply because you did not hear someone saying something that they're not against it. That is something to keep in mind. Be patient with each other. Let us work together as a community, as a nation, to be part of this movement. Maybe, and we pray, that this incident that happened in Minneapolis and the death of, the, of this individual, George Floyd, will be the end of racism in America will be the end of discrimination towards our brothers and sisters in the African-American community and any other minority. We pray that this will wake America up and will make us change the way we look at each other and do not use race or color or nationalities or religion to be a reason for us to hate each other, mistreat each other, or discriminate against each other. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us as a nation, protect us as a community, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our shortcomings. Allahumma ghfir al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat, wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat, al-Ahya'i minhum wal-Amwat, innaka ya rabbana sami'un qareebun mujibu al-Da'awat, ibad Allah, inna Allaha qad amarakum bi amrin bada'a bihi bi nafsihi, wa thanna bi malaikati qudusi haythu qal, inna Allaha wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabi, يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد الله أكبر الله أكبر شهد لا إله إلا الله شهد أن محمد محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين 
الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء عسى أن يكن خيرا منهم ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا بالألقاب بئس الاسم الفسوق بعد الإيمان ومن لم يتب فأولئك هم الظالمون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الذين آمنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن إن بعض الظن إثم ولا تجسسوا ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخي ميتا فكرهتم واتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير 
Allahu Akbar. Sami Allahu liman hamidah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Tahiyyatu ila السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله ربنا الذي لا إله إلا هو اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا جلال والإكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters, I would like to inform you with a few of our programs, inshallah. Uh, Saturday at 3.30 a.m., we are going to do our second golden hour, uh, Tahajjud and Fajr program. We are using the same Zoom link. Join us. And Sunday, we have two programs. The first one is at 11.30 a.m., Tafsir al-Quran. The topic is intercession, given by Brother Mahmoud Wasiq. And then at 12 p.m., we're going to have the lecture of the day. Uh, it is uh, called Peace, Justice, and Healing. And this will be the last series of Dr. Najib Sayyid, inshallah. Join us at 12 p.m. via Zoom and uh, Facebook. Um, and then uh, we have also offering mental and spiritual counseling. Uh, you can find the detailed information on our website. Please check it out. And every Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m., we have food pantry for those who are less fortunate. If you know anyone, please inform them. They can come and uh, benefit from this beautiful service. And as I always remind, please donate generously in order to serve you better and support our beautiful center. And let us pray for those who passed away, specifically Brother Zahij Suleyman Agic and Sister Kadira Ahmed Shalabi. Uh, may Allah bless their souls and let us pray for those who are sick and passed away. Allahumma shfi mardana wa arham mawtana. Allahumma fir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahyai minhum wal amwat inna ka sami'um qaribum mujibu al-da'awat ameen walhamdulillah rabbil alameen al-fatiha bismillahirrahmanirrahim I extend my condolences to the family members. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless their souls, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. See you at Golden Hour.